it's almost inconceivable to people today that only 60 years ago this country had states in which African Americans, African American children could not attend schools or other public places. In striking down official segregation, uh, the Supreme Court did a magnificent thing, a necessary thing, but it also did something much more. Uh, it said that we have ideals in this country. They're enshrined in the Constitution, uh, but they go beyond what the Constitution itself commands. The Constitution only reaches state action, so all private action in the country is beyond the control of the Constitution. So Brown spoke not only to state action, but it said as a country, the 14th Amendment, the Bill of Rights embody, embrace values that we all uh, really share in our lives generally. So it was about integration. It was about overcoming racism. It was about trying to make a society that is just, especially given its past. So for the next generation, the country struggled very actively uh, with both the explicit holding and with the more general symbolic holding of Brown and with great success. I mean, I think it, you know, the country is a far better place uh, than it was in 1953 before Brown versus Board of Education, during this generation right after Brown. Universities all across the country uh, essentially said, we have to do our part to try to help with giving access to African Americans and also Hispanics and Native Americans. Uh, we have to do more to give access uh, to these uh, people who have suffered generations of discrimination and, and um, unfair treatment. And we would benefit, we would all benefit from uh, a much more uh, embracing uh, society. And so universities, again, almost unanimously all across the country, began doing what they had been doing and continue to do in a variety of other ways. That is, build student bodies that are diverse. So uh, universities have, for centuries, uh, said we want people from different parts of the country. We want people from different parts of the world because it's very important that young people come together and study and be educated in an environment where there are people about whom they may have stereotypes or they may not know them and they, they need to get to know the different uh, kinds of people that, that are in the world. So they embraced affirmative action and by calling it that it seemed to distinguish it from other things that it was doing but it was more of the same but embracing of African Americans, Hispanics and Native Americans. This was challenged um, at the end of the 1970s as unconstitutional. Uh, some qualifications were made in a case called Baki. Uh, a decisive opinion by Justice Lewis Powell laid out the rationale for why colleges and universities could do this. And the emphasis he put was on uh, educational benefits of having a diverse student body. But he importantly said, you cannot do this because uh, there's been past discrimination and, and you as a university need to rectify or remedy that. You can't do that. This continued um, as the sort of state of affairs and then as uh, groups opposing affirmative action began to become much more aggressive in the late 1980s and 90s, the issue was joined. Is this really uh, constitutional to, for universities and colleges to engage in affirmative action? Since the mid-90s, I would say, uh, this has been a hotly debated question in America. And it's been debated primarily through the courts. <clears throat> so the major case, of course, which I was involved with, uh, in uh, is Grutter. And that was decided by the Supreme Court in 2003, and a great victory, though five to four, so narrow, but it was a great victory for colleges and universities to uh, continue building diverse student bodies. 
More recently, the challenges have continued, and um, uh, one of the ways in which opponents of affirmative action have responded to uh, Grutter is by trying to get ballot initiatives to amend their constitutions and within states to prohibit affirmative action. Just recently, the Supreme Court narrowly again upheld that kind of a tactic. There are now 10 states in the United States that um, effectively bar affirmative action in public universities within their states. That's where things stand. Brown is more than simply integrating some schools in the South. It was about America and its ideals. And much has been done. We are justifiably proud as a society in the integration that has followed. But any sensible, observant person would have to say there is a lot to be done. Uh, if you look at recent uh, data about the situation in K through 12, public school education, it is shocking how much segregation uh, remains in the United States. Um, recent pieces on the resegregation of the American South uh, point up some school districts more segregated today than even before Brown. Um, we're talking about large percentages of young African-American children who attend all black schools at this point. And many, many American uh, children who are white are in schools that are all white. And therefore, the uh, goal of an integrated society uh, does not begin. It is still significantly present in K through 12 public schools all across the country not only in the South, but New York State recently has been identified as uh, the most segregated um, uh, school system uh, in the United States, and we're talking 50, 60 plus percent of African American children who attend basically all uh, black schools. Um, so we have a, an issue in the society. How are we going to continue uh, how are we going to continue with the work of Brown uh, in the variety of ways that the country has through every sector, every institution, every media company, every uh, general business, uh, major corporations, the military, every part of American society has internalized the need to work on integration and to overcome the past. Um, so there's still work to be done. Universities across the country continue to try to uh, do their part. Uh, but we are gradually, I'm afraid, losing uh, a battle on this. The opponents of affirmative action have this new technique of amending state constitutions. Um, when this is not framed in a normal kind of public debate, but just on a ballot that says, uh, uh, should there be preferential treatment based on race, the way that's framed, uh, the average person uh, may say, no, it doesn't sound right, when in fact, if discussed in a more robust and fulsome way, uh, people would, uh, would accept a different uh, outcome. So uh, we have this new method. It's been quite successful, unfortunately. Uh, we also have a uh, time limit that the Supreme Court in Grutter put on affirmative action, uh, 25 years. We're only 14 years away from that. Uh, not clear what will happen at that point, but um, uh, we also have opponents of affirmative action who are going to continue actively uh, bringing litigation against universities, and, and uh, I'm worried about uh, general counsels becoming too cautious in advising universities about this. Uh, most importantly, uh, I think we've lost as a society or are losing the ability to talk about this in a way that is, uh, gives rise to a full understanding of what we're facing. The theme about uh, the real problem being inequality of income and wealth and that you should focus more on that. And if you do, you will also 
have greater diverse racial and ethnic diversity and therefore you won't have to take race and ethnicity into account consciously in order to address these issues. I, I think it's, it's both false on the solution and, uh, and really misses uh, the point on the, on the first because of course we're concerned with inequality of wealth and income. Of course we want to maintain access from all parts of the society. Of course it's a basic principle in American life that your a child's education should not depend upon the wealth of the family. We should work on that. We do work on that. But where it's faults on the, on the um, solution is that all the scholarship that exists on this points out what is a sort of undeniable fact that the effort to try to achieve greater access for low-income um, children from low-income backgrounds will not really yield racial and ethnic diversity. And that's because of demographics, that uh, in every sector of American life, the largest population uh, is going to be uh, white, and therefore, by focusing only on a particular aspect other than race or ethnicity, you will end up with uh, less racial and ethnic diversity uh, afterwards. We only admit qualified students. Uh, these are students who come from the very um, highest sector of performance on standardized tests and grade point averages. We consider lots of factors uh, in deciding whether to admit people. Uh, the classes that are composed, um, clearly everybody, um, virtually everybody, really likes a diverse student body. They thrive on it. They applaud it when you say uh, at commencement speeches. One of the great things about this is you've had a diverse class experience. Yes, uh, students say. Um, so when Powell said in Baki that you can only talk about educational benefits from diversity and not because of the past and the need to do something now to remedy that, universities took that as an order, basically, uh, a caution not to talk about uh, the historical context and how that plays into the present in the need for addressing uh, uh, what is effectively still a divided society. Uh, and so we speak too often in this vague, highly general, uh, almost banal way of, uh, about diversity because we're afraid, given where the Supreme Court has defined the, the purpose that's acceptable under the Constitution, we're afraid that we will cross that line and our policies will be held unconstitutional. That's very, very unfortunate because it leaves a very important voice in the society, that is higher education, um, essentially out of the picture when it's talking about why it does what it does. Uh, and then, coupled with that is, I'm afraid, a kind of timidity within the political culture not to really address this. I, mean, I think most politicians find it dangerous uh, uh, to, to really come out on these issues uh, and say that they support affirmative action or uh, diversity except in a very general way. So while the reality of a continuing segregation, almost a, a return of, of segregation uh, since Brown, plus uh, problems of, of racism that still persist in the society and a general feeling that there's work to be done, you have the reality and then you have the absence of a robust public debate about this and discussion about what to do. So 60 years after Brown, we're facing a, a situation which we can be quite proud as a nation of what's been accomplished. It's a different world from what it was before. And yet, there is an enormous amount to be done, and we are sliding back in certain ways, and we're not discussing it in a way that I think will be most productive in keeping alive the spirit of Brown.